Hello, this is Dr. Grande. Today's question is, can I analyze the case of Jonathan Luna? Just a reminder, I'm not diagnosing anybody in this video, only speculating about what could be happening in a situation like this. If you enjoy this video, please like it, subscribe to my channel, and consider supporting me on Patreon. I will put the link to Patreon in the description for this video. So first I'll look at the background of this case, I'll move to the timeline of the incident, then offer my analysis. Jonathan Luna was born in 1965. He grew up in the South Bronx in one of the largest public housing projects in New York City. Jonathan's father was Filipino and his mother was black. Jonathan stayed out of trouble when he was young. He spent a lot of time reading books. His friends thought he was a bit unusual. When he was in high school, he would often show up wearing a suit and tie, which apparently was not required attire for that school. He was concerned with his physical appearance and liked to have nice clothing. He graduated from high school and then went to Fordham University. He would graduate in 1987 with a degree in history. He attended the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill and studied law. When his father was diagnosed with cancer, Jonathan took a year off from school to care for him. After returning to law school, Jonathan was elected president of his class. He had a large group of friends and was well-liked. Jonathan met a medical student named Angela Hopkins. They started a serious romantic relationship. Jonathan graduated from law school. He would marry Angela in 1993. The couple would go on to have two sons. That same year, Jonathan went to work for a law firm in Washington, D.C., but then found a job at the Federal Trade Commission. After this, he worked in the Brooklyn District Attorney's Office as a prosecutor. In 1999, he took a job for the U.S. Attorney's Office in Baltimore as an assistant U.S. attorney. He and his wife moved to Elk Ridge, Maryland. By this time, she was a physician. For a while, Jonathan was considered a competent attorney. His co-workers described him as intelligent, engaging, funny, loyal, and enthusiastic. In 2001, Jonathan's situation at work changed. His new boss did not like him. They didn't agree on various issues, like the plea agreements that Jonathan was offering to defendants. In 2002, Jonathan would be involved in a trial that would damage his reputation. He was prosecuting a man for a series of bank robberies. The key evidence in the case was cash. The man had allegedly packaged thousands of dollars in plastic containers. The cash was wheeled into the courtroom during the trial. After the man was found guilty in September of 2002, one of the containers of money went missing. It contained about $36,000. Investigators thought that Jonathan might have something to do with it. There were rumors that he had significant credit card debt. Other people believed Jonathan was innocent, noting that the money was left unattended from time to time. Anybody could have taken it. Regardless of who had taken the money, it was the responsibility of the U.S. Attorney's Office to keep it safe. So Jonathan was responsible in one sense, no matter how one looks at it. Jonathan was given a negative performance review, and put on notice. On one occasion, his boss stormed into his office and told him not to come to work the next day. The boss, of course, was not allowed to do this as there was a process that had to be followed for firing somebody, but it probably still had an impact on Jonathan. He realized his job was not secure. The perceived constant negative attention from his boss was putting a lot of stress on Jonathan. He was thinking about leaving the U.S. Attorney's Office and starting a private practice. It didn't help Jonathan's stress level that he was fined $25 for being late to court. So there was a judge who was apparently pretty strict and was not amused by Jonathan not arriving to court on time. Now moving to the timeline of the incident. On December 3, 2003, 38-year-old Jonathan Luna was in the middle of a trial involving two men who were using a music studio to sell drugs. I don't know what the name of the studio was. I don't even know if it had a name, but I was thinking High Note would have been one possibility. Jonathan worked out a plea deal with the defense attorneys. It was to be presented before that same judge who had fined Jonathan for being late. Jonathan left his office just after 6 p.m., but he returned to his office later that evening. At 9.06 p.m., Luna called one of the defense attorneys and told him he was still working on the paperwork for the plea deal. At 11 p.m., Jonathan received a phone call. Who called him is not known, but he was heard telling a person believed to be his wife 
that he had to go back to the office. Jonathan departed from his office at 11.38 p.m., leaving behind his eyeglasses and his cell phone. Jonathan's four-door Honda Accord was driven north on Interstate 95, passing through the Fort McHenry Toll at 11.49 p.m. We know this because there was an easy pass transponder in that vehicle. It is believed, of course, that Jonathan was driving the vehicle, but that is not known for certain. Jonathan's debit card was used at an ATM in Newark, Delaware at 12.57 a.m., now on December 4. $200 was withdrawn. Jonathan's car traveled to New Jersey and then crossed over into Pennsylvania. Jonathan's debit card was used at a gas station in King of Prussia at 3.20 a.m. A witness at this gas station saw Jonathan. Jonathan was very calm and purchased two tanks of gasoline, two sodas, and a bottle of water. This makes it seem as though somebody must have been with Jonathan. Investigators would later say, after examining surveillance video and reviewing reports, that they believe Jonathan was alone at the gas station. So we see their opinion seems to contradict Jonathan's behavior with buying the two tanks of gas. Jonathan exited the Pennsylvania Turnpike at the Reading-Lancaster Interchange at 4.04 a.m. At 5 a.m., a man named Daniel Gemmon arrived at his job on Dry Tavern Road in Lancaster County, Pennsylvania. This was 95 miles away from Jonathan Luna's office in Baltimore. He parked his truck, went inside to clock in, and walked outside to begin fueling trucks. It was at this time he noticed a small red light near the woods. Daniel was surprised because there was not a lot of traffic in this area. He thought that perhaps somebody had been drinking and driving and drove off the road. One of his coworkers arrived and both of them walked over to where the light was. The red light was from the dashboard of a silver Honda Accord, which was on the bank of the creek, so the front tires were right on the edge. The car was unoccupied. Daniel noticed there was blood on the front seat and the engine was still running. The police were called. They found blood on the driver's door, a fender, and they noticed the blood on the front seat had seeped to the rear floor. Even though the car was on the bank of a creek, it did not appear to have been involved in a collision. About $200 in cash was found scattered in the vehicle. The police looked around the area and found Jonathan Luna lying face down in the creek. He was wearing a suit, tie, and overcoat. In his pocket was his wallet, his identification, and cash. His body had sustained 36 cuts and stab wounds. Many looked like hesitation cuts. They were superficial. But one cut to his left carotid artery was very serious. The injuries appeared to be caused by a penknife that was found at the scene. It belonged to Jonathan. He was pronounced dead from drowning by the coroner at 8.05 a.m. His death was ruled a homicide. So even though he had all those cuts and stab wounds, when he was face down the creek, he drowned. In addition to the stab wounds, there were bruises on Jonathan's testicles and damage to one of his fingernails. Traces of blood from somebody other than Jonathan were found in his vehicle, along with a partial fingerprint. After investigating the route that Jonathan's car traveled, investigators found a toll booth ticket that was turned into the collector when the vehicle exited the Pennsylvania Turnpike. The ticket was bloodstained. The ticket was suspicious for another reason. Jonathan's car, again, had easy pass. There was no need to use a paper ticket. Federal investigators believe that Jonathan's wounds were self-inflicted, perhaps in an effort to get sympathy from his boss and his colleagues. So here we see law enforcement is split on the issue of what happened. Some believe homicide. Others believe it was not. Now moving to my analysis. Investigators chased down many leads trying to get answers in this case. There were about 5,000 tips. They interviewed many people. They searched through computer and financial records. They checked out Jonathan's phone activity. Here's what they found. Jonathan's name had been used on some adult websites. It appears as though he was looking for sexual encounters with women. The location where Jonathan's body was found was known as a place where people would go to have sex, although... Local officials denied that. Jonathan had made suspicious trips to Philadelphia in the month preceding his death. There is a disagreement about whether the trips could have been related to his job. Right before the $36,000 went missing, 
Jonathan filled out a loan application asking to borrow $30,000. He canceled the application after the $36,000 went missing and mysteriously came up with $10,000. He offered no explanation as to where that money came from. Jonathan had credit card debt of about $25,000 across as many as 16 credit cards. His wife was not aware that he had some of those cards. One of the major questions in this case is whether or not somebody was with Jonathan on any part of his trip. Was Jonathan Luna alone? Was somebody else in the vehicle with him? Or was another car driving along with his car? An answer to this question would go a long way towards solving the case. Jonathan's Easy Pass transponder was logged in a few different locations on his route, which may offer some insight into what he was doing. When he was driving in Maryland and Delaware, he was averaging 66 miles per hour. To maintain this average, he probably did not stop. I doubt someone would have entered his vehicle from another moving vehicle, like some type of movie stunt. In New Jersey, he only averaged 44 miles per hour. There would have been very little traffic that time of the morning. It seems likely he did stop at some point on this part of his trip, although it's not known if he met anyone. Jonathan's purchases in King of Prussia made it seem like there was another car with him. Why else would somebody need two tanks of gasoline? But again, the police did not think any other car was with him. Considering all the evidence, what do I think happened to Jonathan Luna? There are two main theories here. I will review both of them and talk about which one I think is more likely. Theory number one is homicide. Under this theory, Jonathan stopped somewhere to pick up one or more individuals, perhaps for the purposes of sex. This could explain why he withdrew $200 in cash and used a paper ticket on the Pennsylvania Turnpike. He did not want to be tracked by the Easy Pass. At some point, whoever Jonathan was with decided to kill him. It probably wasn't planned, as it doesn't appear as though they had a weapon. They used Jonathan's penknife. Any knife can be dangerous, but a penknife is usually considered relatively safe. For example, we don't see a lot of penknife running biker gangs or hear police officers yelling, drop the penknife. After injuring Jonathan, the person somehow escaped from the vehicle undetected. It might have been that they exited his vehicle while it was still on the Pennsylvania Turnpike. Seriously injured, Jonathan drives right up to a creek, gets out, collapses in the water right under the vehicle's engine, and drowns. This theory explains why Jonathan had so many cuts and stabs on his body. Many factors work against this theory, however. For example, if there was a killer, how did they escape the area? Jonathan died in a somewhat rural environment. Why would somebody kill him? He was a prosecutor, therefore some people believe perhaps somebody he put in prison killed him. Why wouldn't the killer bring their own weapon? It also seems suspicious they just happened to pick a time to kill him when he was acting unusual. There were all these other events that made it seem like Jonathan was going in a bad direction with his life, and the killer just happens to pick that time to get involved. Theory number two, Jonathan brought an end to his own life intentionally or accidentally. Jonathan was under a lot of pressure at work. He was not performing well as a prosecutor. He had hired an attorney because he was worried about losing his job. So it looked like he might have been trying to fight that. He did not want to be embarrassed by being fired, and the stress was just too much. In addition, Jonathan had money problems and may have stolen $36,000. He became overwhelmed when working on the plea agreement. He realized he simply could not produce a satisfactory product in the time he had available. He was out of time. It was already late at night. He was due to be in court the next morning. Perhaps this failure, along with everything else, felt like the way of the world on his shoulders. There was no way out. He was going to have to face embarrassment, termination, and possibly arrest. He left his office without his glasses, which he needed to drive, but he may have had another pair in his vehicle, or he just decided to drive poorly. He would end up driving through New Jersey. Maybe he was just trying to fit in. He left his cell phone because he did not want to be tracked or he simply forgot it. Jonathan's intent may have been to stage a kidnapping or assault to gain sympathy or work to buy some time to finish that plea agreement. He sets up this victim story by purchasing two tanks of gas and two sodas. 
It wanted to make it appear as though someone else was there, someone he could blame for the attack. His plan was to cut himself several times while on the Pennsylvania Turnpike. To hide his activity, he accesses the Turnpike with a paper ticket. That ticket, of course, had blood on it when he exited the Turnpike. In the process of creating the injuries, he also causes a serious injury to his carotid artery. He's feeling sick and weak from losing blood. He stopped the vehicle by the creek, passes out, and falls into the water. Now, his death also could have been intentional. Again, he might have believed there was no way out of his dilemma. The second version of this second theory is that all this happened after he was with somebody else. That person didn't hurt him. Rather, he met someone for sex. It might have been one last attempt at enjoyment before death. He might have never actually finalized the act. The testicle bruising situation seems to point to an unsuccessful sexual encounter. With all this in mind, what do I think happened? I believe that theory two is more likely. This was an intentional or accidental death involving just one person. This theory fits the evidence better than the homicide theory. Jonathan had let his life get out of control. He was engaging in infidelity, spending too much money, maybe stealing money, doing a terrible job, making people upset. He was fined by that judge. Nothing was going his way due to his behavior. He simply couldn't adjust to his failures. Of course, this is just my opinion. It also could have been a homicide. Many people believe it was. What lessons can we learn from this case? Among the many frustrating elements in this case is the disagreements about the facets of the case that should have been easy to figure out. For example, we see different stories about whether Jonathan was at risk of being fired, conflicting accounts about whether he had work-related activity in Pennsylvania. This would explain his travel to Pennsylvania if he did have that. There's even a different story about the area where his body was found. Was it a known meeting place for sex, or wasn't it? It appears as though whatever happened to Jonathan, he was definitely the victim of a poor investigation. Those are my thoughts on the case of Jonathan Luna. Please put any opinions and thoughts in the comment section. They always generate an interesting dialogue. As always, I hope you found my analysis of this topic to be informative. Thanks for watching.